So thank you again to Mechanics Bank for sponsoring us. We really appreciate your support throughout the years. Now we're going to get started with our presentation and our first two speakers we're really excited to have here to talk about a subject that I literally know virtually nothing about. So I am very excited about this to learn about cryptocurrency, this thing that I was so convinced would go away until I watched the Super Bowl and realized it's here to stay. So I better get up to speed on what's going on here. So our speakers today are Anthony uh, Desadi and Karen Leo from Desadi, Ching and Leo LLP. And they're going to tell you a little bit about what they do and then they will get started with their presentation. So please welcome them. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hot Topics in Estate Planning with Crypto with myself and um, Karen. I'm going to start off with today's agenda. We're going to start today's seminar with a discussion on estate planning with cryptocurrency. We will talk about the solid components of estate planning, um, which includes custody, planning, and administration. We will then take a look at the taxation of cryptocurrency and NFTs. And then we'll finish off today's discussion with a look at the estate and gift tax consequences of transferring cryptocurrency and digital assets. By the way of introduction, my name is Anthony Diazdi. I represent clients on matters of US federal tax, international tax, and state tax matters. Karen, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much, Anthony. And thank you, um, everyone, for coming today. Um, I know it's been very exciting for us to go ahead and uh, put this together for you guys. Um, this is obviously a topic that's receiving a lot of interest, a lot of attention in our practice. Um, you know, daily we're receiving um, calls um, with people um, curious to know about, um, you know, specifically the taxation of cryptocurrency, how to put it on their forms, and, you know, those kind of um, the, the repercussions of that. Um, it's now, I believe, going on to about 10 years that Anthony and I have been working together. Um, and at our practice, um, we see we represent a lot of uh, individuals um, regarding cryptocurrency, uh, primarily uh, representing them through audits. Um, we also um, represent uh, individuals in um, disclosing their cryptocurrency on their returns um, and also some tax planning matters um, involving that. So on that note, um, let's go ahead and begin. So I think um, you know the best way to start out here is uh, what is cryptocurrency? Um, cryptocurrency is obviously something that's grown in popularity over the last few years, especially surging during the pandemic, as well you know. Uh, cryptocurrency is basically a type of digital or virtual currency. Um, it uses cryptography um, as, for security. And what draws a lot of people to crypt cryptocurrency um, is the ability to transact in an anonymous, secure, and in a trustless matter, manner. Um, is basically a decentralized way of transacting. Um, so meaning that no bank or any other kind of intermediary, traditional type intermediary is required. Virtual currency um, is a digital representation of the value that functions as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value um, other than the representation of you know, generally um, the United States dollar or a, a foreign currency or something of that type. Um, so cryptocurrency, again, allows parties to transact directly without using an intermediary, uh, using blockchain technology. Um, that's a shared distrib a distributed ledger that verifies, records, and settles transactions on a secure encrypted network. Um, basically, what that means is that you can kind of, if you have the right information, you can kind of pick out through the blockchain actual uh, transactions and all the information about that. Um, a lot of major uh, retailers do accept uh, cryptocurrencies, um, like Bitcoin, obviously, is some, one of the more popular ones. Um, however, cryptocurrency isn't necessarily like money. Um, money meaning, you know, what we think of as, as paper and, um, and coin, something that's um, declared by Congress as so-called legal tender. Um, cryptocurrency is also unlikely to be a type of uh, security. Um, however, uh, cryptocurrency um, can mostly be defined as a commodity. Um, the CFTC, which is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, has declared that certain cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, as commodities. So it's actually written out there. 
Um, if you've been following the news in any way, shape, or, sh or form, you'll see that uh, cryptocurrencies are obviously um, extremely volatile um, compared to, especially to financial, uh, conventional financial instruments like you know stocks and bonds. Um, and that volatility, a lot of times, um, plays a lot into the appeal and why people are so interested in it right now. Um, there are also subsets of cryptocurrency known as stable coins um, that are intended to be, uh, I think, a little bit more stable um, versus like a fiat type currency. Um, the stable coins are a type of cryptocurrency in which uh, the issuer will often put high quality liquid assets in reserve to ensure repayment of virtual, virtual currency. So you can see that there's a whole um, variety and range um, when it comes to uh, cryptocurrencies. Okay, moving on to the overall goal of uh, crypto estate planning. So when we talk about goals with uh, cryptocurrency planning, we're talking about you know, what ways um, can we find and, and see that can safely and efficiently pass cryptocurrency on to um, the next generation. That's generally what uh, people are, are going to be um, coming to, all you lovely folks, uh, um, to assist them um, with accomplishing. And uh, one of the reasons why estate planning in this area is so difficult um, is because cryptocurrency is, is such a revolutionary, uh, new, and constantly evolving um, type of uh, uh, case. Um, so even though it's been around for you know, around 12 years, um, they've seen astronomical growth. And uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't, we don't really know what the future is going to look like, but we do know that they're, they seem like they're going to be here to stay. Um, if, we have any, uh, if looking back in the last 10 years are, is any indication, um, most people are going to see kind of uh, these staggering returns um, from their cryptocurrency transactions. Um, with that said, uh, virtual currency that's inadvertently lost by individuals is um, staggering and really unfortunate. It's estimated that um, about 4% of Bitcoin that gets minted every year um, gets lost. That's just something that kind of pulled off of Google. Um, so maybe someone can double check that statistic, but um, it sounds like that's about that's about right. Um, so at, at about today's value, that's going to be like 240 plus billion dollars. Um, the goal of cryptocurrency estate then is to be able to leave these assets um, to the next generation so that they'll be able to fully benefit from them um, if that's something that they want to go ahead and do. Um, so a well-drafted estate plan, it, it should go without saying, um, can ensure that cryptocurrency is, is passed along safely. So when we talk about passing things on state, um, safely, right? one of the first um, and main issues that needs to be considered is um, what, we, what we call a cryptocurrency estate um, custody. Okay, so custody is, is uh, talking about how cryptocurrency is going to be stored. Why does this matter? Okay, there's two points that we wanted to talk about. There's these external threats and um, self, what we call self-sabotage. So external threats include you know, the cryptocurrency holder's account um, getting hacked. Um, we have a lot of calls from clients who've actually had their funds being uh, frozen by third parties, someone seizing those assets, um, sometimes the government coming in and, and freezing them. Um, so this fat first category deals with these kind of external uh, forces, you can imagine, um, that, 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 that takes control of someone's uh, cryptocurrency. The second is self-sabotage, and that's the second threat here that we're going to discuss. And that's you know, the general case that you've heard about a lot in the news, um, where you know, someone happens to lose their PIN or password. You can see how that happens very easily. Um, and they lose the ability, unfortunately, to access that cryptocurrency. Um, in, the, in the news, I, I believe there was a very famous article on The New Yorker um, regarding um, a, a, a gentleman who had, um, was an early adopter of I believe it was Bitcoin, and he had lost his USB um, drive, um, this hard drive, I'm sorry, in, in the landfill. And he was trying, fighting tooth and nail, um, begging the locality to try to, to have the right to excavate the landfill in order to get um, his hard drive back. Um, so, you know, this is definitely a very, very real and uh, uh, danger. So, um, you know, when it comes to when it comes time to developing an estate plan for your client, the first question needs to be: How are they going to be custodying their cryptocurrency? And going on that same on that route, um, 
we talk about um, when we talk about custody, uh, we need to talk about um, wallets, okay? Cryptocurrency wallets. Um, so when we cost, when we're, um, what is a wallet? It's a simple concept um, that basically has two components. Um, when you invest in cryptocurrency, you receive um, a public key and a private key. Um, the public key is the type of kind of mailing address you can think of, and um, that's where the cryptocurrency is is, is sent to. Um, and the other component is this private key, and that's your official digital signature. Um, it proves the cryptocurrency's owner's ability to send crypto to a third party. Without this private key, you cannot um, transact. Um, so that's what a wallet does. It, it, it basically um, stores the crypto holder's uh, private key. So it's probably in this context, um, if you're new to this idea, it's probably better to think of the wallet as more of a keychain and not necess necessarily as a wallet per se. Um, so there's also um, a fun little uh, cornerstone um, that, uh, that, that people like to say, was it's not your keys, not your Bitcoin. That's kind of the way that you can think about um, about this whole idea. Okay, uh, so here we have a brief overview of wallets. And um, what I basically, as we kind of go through this list, how I want you guys to think about it, is that as we move higher up on the list, um, that's, there's a higher kind of external risk with this type of wallet. And as you go down, um, there's, um, it can lower the self sabotage So let me go ahead and um, go through the list, and we can kind of uh, see it from there. So there really is a wide variety for how cryptocurrency can be custodied. Uh, the first type of wallet is known as a custodial type wallet, which I have highlighted there. So custodial wallets um, is when a cryptocurrency, a crypto holder, is given custody of the virtual currency um, to somebody else. Um, so custodial wallets can be held in either foreign or US type exchanges. Um, you're basically giving the custody of the virtual currency to some, someone else, some other entity, um, and the cryptocurrency investor sends their virtual currency to an exchange um, in a foreign country in, in this example. Um, in, in this example, then the investor is subjecting him or herself to um, a certain degree of risk, as you can imagine. Um, this is because there's not a lot of enforcement mechanisms, unfortunately, available, um, especially in to, uh, when it comes to a foreign type exchange. So there's a lot of uh, danger, uh, I think, inherent risk there. Um, there are also US-based online exchanges um, that will custody cryptocurrency. Um, they, those are subject to regulation on um, US soil. Their offices can be visited. They can be sued in the United States should anything go wrong. So it's a little bit of a, of, of a, of a safety net there. Um, US-based exchanges are less risky than foreign exchanges, as you can imagine. Um, however, the investor is still um, entrusting in somebody else um, their money. And the cryptocurrency investor is um, subjected to the, uh, the US exchange's rules. Uh, furthermore, a cryptocurrency investor takes the risk that a US-based exchange can be hacked. Um, that's with, with, with anything, but that's, that's always still an, an issue here. Um, investors can also custody uh, their cryptocurrency themselves through a non-custodial type wallet, which I also have, uh, which I have here on the second point. A non-custodial wallet is when the cryptocurrency holder is keeping custody for him or herself, and that's what you're going to see a lot of. Um, the problem with holding cryptocurrency through a non-custodial type wallet um, are um, uh, is that you know. The, the probability of self-sabotage increases in that, in that scenario. Uh, a number of non-custodial wallets are the hardware-type wallets that a lot of you might be familiar with. Um, they're little devices um, that are plugged into the computer, and um, they, the individual, individual downloads software that allows them um, to enter into the transactions. So examples of hardware wallets are like USB sticks, ledger, um, and key key, et cetera. When someone is done using with the, the, the device, it is unplugged from the internet and decreases the risk of hacking. But you know, obviously, you can imagine that it probably increases the chance of them losing it. Um, so, 
on the top uh, top end of the uh, again is the high highest risk to an investor um, is the non U.S. online exchange. Um, this is someone who is outside the reach of the U.S. law enforcement. Um, the cryptocurrency investor is sending their virtual currency to someone in another country. Um, again, there's not that much enforcement mechanism um, should they decide to hold onto the cryptocurrency forever. Um, there is a U.S.-based exchange companies that hold the cryptocurrency, which I said before, and then there is U.S.-based online exchanges, which will uh, custody the cryptocurrency that are subject to regulation. Um, I think that was um, most of it. Um, there's also this kind of hot wallet that we want to talk about um, that's online and where a crypto investor would um, create a wallet to purchase the cryptocurrency, and it, it also retains um, any interest that might accrue in there as well. So I do have um, some exchanges here that you guys can go through. I believe these slides were also sent to you guys, um, but I wanted to kind of throw out some of the, I guess, better known examples of all of these um, types of wallets. Okay. So uh, choosing a custody, uh, custody uh, plan, how to choose. So again, that was an overview of the different types of wallets. Um, so each client, when they come in, um, it should be evaluated. And a custom plan needs to be developed um, even before there's any kind of estate plan developed. Uh, that's because the external risks and any risk of self-sabotage needs to be mitigated. Um, every person investing in cryptocurrency should do some self-evaluation to determine what is a perfect fit for them. Um, and I tried to... Um, lay out in this slide some factors um, for you guys to go ahead and consider. Um, so the first being, most you know, importantly, you know, how much is it that's being invested in cryptocurrency? Uh, the higher the value of cryptocurrency um, at that moment, uh, the more secure right, the wallet needs to be. And the investor uh, may want to uh, think very seriously about keeping that wallet um, off the exchanges. Um, so you know, basically, essentially putting onto cold storage in, in that case would be um, advised. The second is the technical proficiency of that individual, right? Um, how uncomfortable is the investor using some of those devices and, 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 and moving the money around themselves? How, how comfortable are they with the, with the concepts and transacting? Um, in cases where the cryptocurrency investor is not typically uh, very proficient, um, they may not feel comfortable using those devices or moving the crypto assets on their own. Um, in those situations, the individual may feel more comfortable um, custodying, a uh, self-custodying may not feel comfortable self custodying their cryptocurrency. And in those cases, it might make sense to have a third party uh, custody the cryptocurrency uh, for their ease of use. Finally is uh, the timeline. And what I mean by timeline is how long the individual intends to hold on to the cryptocurrency. Um, in an, especially in a non-custodial type uh, situation. If there's a shortened timeline, then it might make sense to leave the cryptocurrency on the exchange. If it's for something for longer, then you can imagine it would be the opposite. So overall, there's these uh, three guideposts that I want you guys to remember and that should be followed. The first is that uh, the crypto assets need to be secure, okay? Uh, the second is that the overall strategy to hold crypto assets needs to be simple. Um, if the plan is too complicated, uh, the risk of self-sabotage again uh, increases. Uh, and lastly, trying to memorize uh, seed phrases uh, are going to be a terrible idea. Um, so it needs to be really accessible. Um, any passwords or pins needs to be somewhere that's easy to, that's easy to reach for that by that individual and, and accessible by that individual, but again, at the same time, still secure. Uh, one thing I will say about these hardware wallets is that they typically work um, if they have a pin um, that allows the investor to unlock that wallet. Um, but um, again, these have a, what's called a seed phrase, which is what I was talking about earlier there. And um, most hardware wallets come with that seed phrase. Um, it's like a backup to that wallet. Um, so let's say if you have a ledger with one Bitcoin in it um, and you lose it or it's destroyed, as long as you have that C phrase you'd be set up in that wallet, you'd be able to um, call that back up. Um, 
So as long as a seed phrase is available, a new ledger can be purchased. Um, it can be used to restore the wallet, and the investor can then access their cryptocurrency. So that's one of the main benefits of having that hardware wallet. Um, uh, and that, is that the camera with that seed phrase? Um, so if their investor is t thinking about custodying their cryptocurrency, um, that, that seed phrase, again, should be heavily guarded. And it needs to be separate, guarded and separate from that wallet. Okay, what is an um, estate plan here? Okay, so once the custody plan has been developed with your client, um, it's now time to put together an estate plan. The first step towards making an effective estate plan, I believe, um, involving cryptocurrency is to create something that's called a crypto memorandum um, and uh, to safeguard those assets. And that crypto memorandum needs to provide adequate cryptocurrency access instructions for the asset holders, heirs, personal representatives, and um, trustees. Uh, so a crypto memorandum begins with a, a simple letter uh, that the cryptocurrency holder would draft uh, to their heirs, notifying them of their crypto holdings. The letter should warn the recipients um, about ways the assets could be lost or stolen. Ideally, the crypto memorandum should be distributed um, through a trust and provide several levels of oversight to minimize risk of loss or theft. And um, it should also not be attached to the will. Um, we. We, uh, we believe that um, you know, the client, it, it's helpful for crypto memorandum when uh, clients can write that letter by hand. Um, the letter can go ahead and be stored in a tamper evident seal type envelope with their signature written across the seal. Um, a helper should be named, ideally someone that's not the heir, of course, um, who is knowledgeable about cryptocurrencies and can guide that individual through it to assist in gaining access to and distributing those digital access, um, assets. Um, the person should be aware of their role too, of, of course, prior um, to the client's estate plans. Um, include in their letter an inventory of the digital assets and where they are located. Um, include a list of the devices, uh, software, and exchanges as applicable um, used uh, to access each of the holdings. So you know, hardware wallets, flash drives, paper wallets, laptops, phones, et cetera. Um, and then lastly, uh, document where to find the information that heirs will need to access their digital assets. I mean, it can kind of go without, uh, what I really want to kind of stress is that, you know, um, of course, fortune always um, uh, favors the prepared, right? And you really can't do enough, especially in this, in this uh, area, to kind of, you ha really have to be very diligent um, and very detail-oriented and really push um, uh, for you know this kind of uh, transparency through um, their, all these transactions, so you, th these clients really need to. And I feel like generally, at least with the clients that we've um, spoken to, that uh, generally people who deal in cryptocurrency are pretty, um, very, very um, uh, uh, tend to be very organized individuals who will have all this information on hand. But um, it's always good again to stress that and to have that all compiled um, in, into this again this one location, which would be the crypto memorandum. Just check on timing here. The crypto memorandum itself shouldn't contain any crypto uh, key seeds or access uh, codes. That information, along with wallet backups, should be so stored uh, stored separately. And you know, we're just kind of just you're just imagining all the worst case scenarios, right? So in something that's fireproof, waterproof, um, access control type location, um, the clients should store that plan um, in a safe place that their heirs can find and access in their death and, and or incapacity. Um, a backup can also be stored in a separate but similar safe and accessible location. Um, like I said before, the plan needs to be a separate document from the client's will, but it may reference the will or vice versa. If a client owning cryptocurrency becomes mentally disabled um, due to an accident, illness, or age-related cognitive decline, um, a power of attorney with a language giving the agent authority over the digital assets and instructions for managing the holdings um, is a, a a critical component of the client's estate plan. The power of attorney should also provide instructions on where to find um, the client's access plan, and any person named in this role should um, be knowledgeable about crypto, have a legal duty to act in the client's best interest, and um, 
have malpractice insurance. <laughs> um, providing a, crypto, a cryptocurrency access plan for clients as heirs is not enough uh, to ensure that these um, assets get, to, uh, get distributed according to the client's wishes. Um, an access plan should not include any distributions um, as the will or trust provides for those type of instructions. Um, Again, private keys, seeds, words, and access code should not be included in the will since those are a matter of public record. Uh, so we don't want to give that information away. Another thing to keep in mind um, is that the modern estate plan does not plan um, a, a, a lot of times for um, uh, does not plan for the for the deaths and uh, it also plans for incapac incapacity. Um, this is something to consider now with the prevalence of of you know, with COVID and, and all of that that we've experienced through this pandemic, um, even without COVID concerns, you know, people get sick. Um, cryptocurrency market is, is pretty volatile. We've been following. It's kind of taken a nosedive recently. Um, crypto traders do, do not want to lose opportunity for potential windfalls because he or she is incapacitated. Um, That's why it's so important to have executory powers and a crypto memorandum. And with that, I'll turn that over to um, Anthony to go ahead and speak about uh, crypto estate um, administration. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> As you all probably know, um, estate administration involves a period of marshalling, um, which after someone passed away, there's an executor or administrator who's tasked with um, the duties of collecting all the assets, both intangible and tangible, and notifying financial institutions or other institutions of the assets that were owned by the sedent. These um, individuals have fiduciary powers and duties. Um, in most states, um, as in California, um, in addition to a typical fiduciary, a digital a executor can be named. This is someone that can um, basically handle the digital assets of the estate, such as cryptocurrency. Um, they, as, as with any other fiduciary, they have to they have specific um, obligations such as avoidance of self-dealing, duty of confidentiality. Um, they have to manage the assets appropriately and maximize the estate to the best of, of their ability and maintain the funds of the estate. These powers are um, relegated in uh, probate code section 870 through 884. And um, this, the acronym for these, this um, law that governs this is uh, RFADA. RFADA um, allows a California testator, um, that's basically an individual who made a will or a testament or a grantor, which is an, that's a person who um, created a, a living trust, to give his or her executor the fiduciary power over his um, or her um, digital assets. Now, why is this important? Um, RFADA, as I said, it, it grants the access of the custodial accounts, such as cryptocurrency. Um, but really what's important for is that a lot of these exchanges, as a matter of fact, all these exchanges have policies on the terms of service agreements. Um, these terms of service agreements have their own contractual obligations and own rights, which are separate and distinct than what we typically um, think of when we're looking at an asset to be um, passed on. Basically, if an individual has a cryptocurrency on an exchange, um, and if the heirs cannot access the cryptocurrency, then basically the, the, those assets may actually wind up reverting back to the exchange. Um, so basically, to prevent this type of scenario from taking place, this is why uh, California as most states um, in the country have adopted uh, the RFADA provisions and allow for an exec a digital executor to be named to prevent um, cryptocurrency from basically um, being uh, eliminated from uh, someone's estate. Um, basically, the provisions in RFADA trump um, any kind of provisions in a will or a trust. Um, so it's important to kind of consider RFADA when somebody has um, digital assets. Um, I think a good way to kind of think about it is that you know, we all go ahead and, and have purchased um, iTunes um, from an Apple app. Um, and what happens is when we pass away, our rights to that song go. You basically have a lease. You have a lease for life in that, 
that tune that you wind up purchasing um, from iTunes. It, it's kind of similar when you hold uh, cryptocurrency on an exchange. Um, so it's extremely important to go ahead and have a, um, an executor, a, dig a digital executor appointed so um, that digital executor can go ahead and, and retrieve those, uh, the cryptocurrency that is on an on, on, on online exchange. So to kind of hammer the, the importance out of Rafada and um, you know, how, how something like this can play out in an estate, I have three hypotheticals here. So uh, let's start off first, first with hypothetical one. So hypothetical one, Tom is, re is a resident of San Francisco. Tom is a crypto enthusiast who started buying Bitcoin and various cryptocurrencies on the US and non-US online exchanges in 2018. He's married. However, Tom's wife is not very tech savvy and has no idea how cryptocurrency works. Um, Tom's crypto trading has yielded him a, a approximate worth of about $500,000. One day while uh, riding his motorcycle to San Jose, Tom gets into an accident and dies. Tom doesn't have a will or a trust and holds his crypto on the exchanges and on a hardware wallet. So what happens to Tom's crypto assets? Well, in this situation, Tom's wife will be in a position to have to figure out Crypto, Tom's cryptocurrency, if, 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 if indeed she even, even knows about it. Um, but assuming that Tom's wife knows about the cryptocurrency, she's going to have to go ahead and start first with the US exchange that Tom's cryptocurrency is on. Um, Tom's, crypto, Tom's wife will need to go through a hierarchy. First, um, she will have to determine if she's named as a beneficiary on the account. Now, some US exchanges allow for a beneficiary to be designated. Not all of them, but some do. So in this case, if Tom named uh, his wife as a beneficiary of his uh, online exchange, then no problem. Um, then basically what Tom's wife's going to have to do is present a death certificate to get the access to the funds. Um, however, um, if, if, if there is no um, situation where there's a beneficiary named on the online exchange, and if Tom's wife does not have access to Tom's passwords, um, you know, it's, the, the cryptocurrency may be lost. Um, it's basically going to be determined on how the exchange's um, contractual agreements are, are kind of determined. All right. Um, as for the non-UX exchanges, um, if Tom's wife does not have um, his passwords, um, they're, they're probably going to be lost um, because the, there, there's probably not going to be any kind of um, way that Tom's wife, any kind of legal recourse that Tom's wife's going to have to actually go ahead and obtain that cryptocurrency that's on those foreign exchanges. Regarding the crypto on the hardware wallet, um, Tom's wife is going to have to figure out how the wallet works, download the software, and attempt to obtain the cryptocurrency if she indeed even knows the passwords. Um, so th that could be a, a serious problem. Um, and then, assuming that Tom's wife can actually obtain any of the cryptocurrency, Tom's wife's going to have to figure out how the wallets work and convert the cryptocurrency into US dollars. So um, under hypothetical one, um, uh, we, it's, it's definitely not going to be a, a very favorable uh, situation. Okay, and let's go to um, hypothetical two. So Matt and Kim both live in San Francisco, lived in San Francisco, California. They were married in 2020. They decided not to spend a lot of money on an estate plan and decided to use legal Zoom or legal doom to draft <laughs> a, a basic will. The will did not include any provisions related to access of digital assets um, about the cryptocurrency. Later that year, Matt began investing in cryptocurrency and had about 500,000 in cryptocurrency on Coinbase, a US-based exchange. He had another $500,000 worth of ledger uh, on, his, on his hardware, hardware uh, wallet. Um, Kim didn't know about, was not aware of these exchanges, um, didn't know how much money was on the, on the uh, crypto exchanges. Um, one day when um, Matt was rock climbing in Yosemite, he fell off a cliff and died. Um, Got to be careful out there. Um, 
what, what happens to crypto assets? Um, at first glance, it seems that Kim is in better place than um, John's wife was. Um, but unfortunately, it's not the case. Um, there is no crypto memorandum in place um, for, for any kind of instructions how to obtain the uh, crypto. Um, there is no direct bequest of the cryptocurrency. Um, there is no uh, powers granted under Rafada. So thus, mass cryptocurrency will basically fall into the terms of the service agreement where it's held on the exchanges. And um, basically, Kim will be subject to those um, terms of the service agreement. Hopefully, um, the exchange has a, a, a beneficiary that is designated. All right, so let's now go to hypo hypothetical three. Uh, Sally is a resident of Danville. Um, and she heard about cryptocurrency from a friend and purchased some crypto in 2019. She purchased the crypto on a China-based exchange where it sat there for over a year. In late 2020, she moved her coins onto a hardware wallet and had an estate planning attorney draft a cryptocurrency memorandum. Um, the memorandum provided for the location of cryptocurrency, instructions, and named a neutral third party to assist. Um, in 2021, um, she died, um, leaving all her crypto to her husband, who is not familiar with cryptocurrency. So what happens in this case to the crypto assets? Um, in this scenario, Sally has an estate plan, and her husband has all the right powers. Um, Sally has moved her cryptocurrency from a risky exchange to a hardware wallet with instructions to her loved ones. So in, in essence, Sally has de-risked her estate. Sally's husband will be able to access the, the cryptocurrency, and there will not be any issues here. OK, um, so let's now move on to an area which is, which is important, as, as important as uh, talking about um, estate planning. And that's um, basically the concept of tax and, and how cryptocurrency is taxed. Um, any estate planning attorney should understand how cryptocurrency is, is taxed because um, it, it, you're going to wind up dealing with it sooner or later. Um, as you all probably heard, cryptocurrency is considered property um, in the United States from an income tax perspective. Um, so what does this mean? Why is this important? Well, this means that it gets a step up or step down basis when the holder dies, depending on whether the cryptocurrency's value has risen or fallen since the deceased purchased it. Treating cryptocurrency as property and not currency for federal income tax purposes, just as everyone should know, is a departure from the rest of the world, which tends to treat cryptocurrency as a virtual currency um, with the same standard as, um, as fiat currencies, which is um, basically just currencies of um, countries. Um, so here in the US, basically, um, when there's a gain or loss in cryptocurrency, it's subject to the capital gains rules. Um, and what that means is that if uh, a holder of cryptocurrency holds on to uh, a crypto asset for more than a year, it's taxed at favorable capital gains rates. The maximum favorable capital gain rate is 20%. There is a... Um, a Medicare tax on top of that in some cases, depending on the income itself of the individual, how much, is, how much uh, income that, that person has made and how much trades uh, that person has made. But uh, that addition, there's an addition to the capital gains of 3.8%. So your maximum tax on the, the exchange or sale of a crypto asset would be 23.8% plus whatever uh, state tax. If the crypto asset or cryptocurrency is held for less than one year, it's taxed at ordinary rates. Um, as of right now, that, that, that could be up to as, as high as 35% or, or a little bit higher. Um, and then there's also a, another 3.8% that gets tacked onto that as well. But where people have the, the, the biggest issues with cryptocurrency um, is this concept of basis. Um, you know, we, we, basis is important because we, we talked about the step-up basis rules or step-down basis rules. But determining uh, the, the basis of cryptocurrency, it, it's, it's not as easy as one thinks. People think that determining a basis of a cryptocurrency is just basically what you paid for the asset. 
um, which is which is fine if the if the basically the asset, the crypto asset was was purchased on an online exchange. You just go ahead and you you take that amount, you add to that your your, your transaction fees, and there you go. But a lot of people tend to acquire uh, cryptocurrency um, in other means. They tend to purchase it from peer to peer exchanges, or they tend to go ahead and they purchase on a, a off the chain type of transaction. And in that case, um, determining one's basis in cryptocurrency can be um, quite difficult. Um, and when it comes time for determining basis, there are three different accounting methods that come in place. Um, one is called um, first in, first out, or FIFO. Um, the other one's last in, last out, LIFO. And then the third is uh, highest in, first out, which is a HIFO. Um, I could teach an entire class just based on um, the accounting of cryptocurrency, the tax accounting of it, so we're not going to dive into it. But it's important to kind of understand that there are different accounting rules when it comes time for determining uh, the basis of crypto, cryptocurrency and crypto assets. Um, we often hear a lot about mining of cryptocurrency. Um, cryptocurrency mining is a process which, which, which basically you have transactions between users um, and because of the transactions of, of the users, what will happen is, is that a, an exchange will or a, a company will offer um, free coins, so to speak. They'll offer coins as an incentive um, for um, a, a, a trader. Um, and these, these coins itself, it, it's, it's difficult because you, you get a, a coin and you know, they get it for free. So how do you go ahead and, and determine that, uh, the basis of that asset for, from income tax, in income tax point of view? And how that is determined is it's the fair market value of the cryptocurrency that's mined. Whatever that fair market value is of the day of that, the granting of that coin is going to be the basis. It becomes more complicated when you have a situation where you have an individual who's getting an awful lot of coins uh, mined. Um, and that's when you know, one of those um, methods of accounting kind of come into play. And if used properly, when it comes time for selling those mine coins, you could wind up having a significant decrease in tax consequences. All right, um, then let's talk now about um, hard forks and airdrops. Um, so in 2019, IRS issued Revenue Ruling 2019-24. Um, this provides guidance regarding the taxation of hard forks and airdrops. For the most part, a hard fork is a blockchain software update used to correct security flaws that adds new functions or reverses transactions. Hard forks do not undo a network's transaction history. Hard forks do create permanent uh, divergence uh, from previous blockchains and may, may require a forced exchange of old network's virtual currency um, and for, in, in the, the, the chain itself. A hard fork may also result in a split in a cryptocurrency's blockchain. In brief, hard fork represents a permanent change to the coding of virtual currency's underlying blockchain that necessitates a, uh, a creation of a separate and distinct cryptocurrency. A hard fork will impact the basis and taxation of cryptocurrency. Um, however, the Internal Revenue Service and the Department of Treasury have yet to issue uh, comprehensive guidance in this area. Um, there, are three, there are three theories out there, however, um, which will kind of determine or can be used to determine the basis and taxation of this type of cryptocurrency. Some view a hard fork as a receipt of a new asset. Under this view, the investor would recognize ordinary income on the opening market value of the new cryptocurrency against the cost basis of the ordinarily acquired cryptocurrency. A second view is to treat a hard fork as a spin-off or a stock split in which the, ex uh, the existing cryptocurrency splits into two. And under this theory, the virtual trader would recognize income on the new currency and would receive a split um, in the cost basis um, on the original uh, cryptocurrency and, uh, and the new cryptocurrency. Um, it's, it's an interesting theory. Unfortunately, the, from what I've been hearing, the IRS doesn't agree with this one. Um, 
The third and final approach is to apply a zero basis to the new cryptocurrency. Um, this, the rationale for this approach is that the new cryptocurrency is a new asset um, and the validity of the crypto uh, market makes the assigning of the market value uh, difficult um, to make, so therefore there is no basis in the asset, meaning that when someone goes ahead and sells uh, the cryptocurrency in this situation, uh, there will be no basis. Okay. Finally, another transaction unique to cryptocurrency is an airdrop. IRS Revenue Ruling 2019-24 explains that an, event, an investor who receives airdrops of new virtual currency to their digital wallet after a hard fork realizes ordinary gross income on the date of the new currency that's received, regardless of whether or not it was converted into U.S. dollars. Um, this, this, is, this, this is quite challenging because basically what you could have here is a situation where um, an individual receives an airdrop, doesn't recognize anything in, in the terms of him actually going ahead or her going ahead and converting uh, the cryptocurrency to U.S. dollar. However, uh, for purposes of the IRS, um, under this revenue ruling, there's a taxable event, whether or not your client knows about it or not. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about losses um, in cryptocurrency. We hear a lot about people saying, well, you know, we're going to get big gains in a cryptocurrency. Well, cryptocurrency is now has dropped significantly uh, recently. So what happens when someone goes ahead and suffers a loss under the Internal Revenue Code? Uh, well, under Code Section 165A, uh, there is a, a, a deduction allowed for losses sus sustained um, by someone in, in, in any kind of um, uh, investments. Um, however, in situations where someone is in, uh, trading cryptocurrency, the losses itself can only be used to offset other losses in cryptocurrency. Um, in cases when there's a married filing uh, joint couple, um, they're allowed an additional $3,000 loss against um, ordinary income or any other type of assets. In, in case where there was a married filing separate situation, that loss itself is limited to $1,500. Um, Karen was indicating before that cryptocurrency is not a security, um, and it's just correct. It's not a cryptocurrency, it's not a, a security, and that's important because the worthless security rules do not apply. Worthless security rules would typically allow an investor to take losses from a, a uh, worthless security against other source of income, but since cryptocurrency is not a security, that cannot be done. We've heard a lot of stories about the theft of cryptocurrency. So one would tend to wonder, well, if they lose money um, because of a hack or something of that nature, um, their cryptocurrency is lost or stolen, can they actually go ahead and take a deduction for it? Well, prior to 2017, yes, they could. But under the new Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was enacted at the end of 2017, they cannot. The only time someone can actually go ahead and take a loss um, for cryptocurrency that's been stolen um, is if Congress goes ahead and declares a, a disaster, which I don't think is going to happen. Um, on the upshot, in 2026, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is supposed to um, basically sunset, and maybe the theft loss uh, deduction provisions will come back again, and some will be able to use them. But for now, they can, people cannot, unfortunately, go ahead and take a tax deduction for losses in cryptocurrency, uh, particularly in the case of theft losses. All right, wash sales, and how do wash sales apply to cryptocurrency? Um, a crypto trader, a lot of times they like to do wash sales. Um, basically, when they go ahead and sell or trade a virtual cryptocurrency asset, asset and buy it back again. Um, and so, under Inter Internal Revenue Code Section um, 1091, this sort of uh, behavior is, is not allowed when it comes time for securities. Um, however, um, because cryptocurrency is not a stock and not a security, you can go ahead and participate in wash sales if you have cryptocurrency. Um, on a, on a side note to that, um, as part of the Build Back America um, plan, if it would be enacted, the wash sale rules would, would specifically apply to cryptocurrency. But as of right now, um, since that, um, that bill has not passed, wash sales can still be used um, as an effective ta tax planning tool um, for individuals who have cryptocurrency. So we'll talk real quick about uh, 
futures. Um, a futures contract is an agreement between two parties to buy or sell an asset um, on upon agreed upon price. So when a cryptocurrency investor buys a future contract, he or she does not own the underlying asset. The crypto investor has a legal contract to buy or sell an asset in the future. Um, this means that there's really no physical uh, exchange of the cryptocurrency between the two parties um, until the contract expires. Um, so when, this, when, the, when the sale itself is done, actually will wind up happening in, in, in a uh, futures contract. In most cases, the, the, the price difference is going to be between the entry position and the exit position. Um, this is a very, very complicated area, um, so I'm not going to spend any time on it because um, it's probably beyond the, the scope of this course. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, donations. Uh, donations is, is something that's used um, in estate planning. Um, so what happens if your client comes to you and wants to donate cryptocurrency? Um, and the, so typically the way it works uh, in, in this situation is that as long as it's a recognized um, organization according to the Internal Revenue uh, Code rules, donating cryptocurrency is allowed. However, how you go ahead and report the actual asset for purposes of the deduction itself has to be looked at. Um, so basically, um, it, it, it depends on how long the crypto asset has been held. Um, if the crypto asset or cryptocurrency has been held for one year or longer, uh, the contribution of the cryptocurrency or the crypto asset itself is equal to the fair market value of that cryptocurrency. However, if the cryptocurrency being donated um, was, has been held by that, by that client for less than one year, the value of the deduction itself is going to be the lesser of the donor's adjusted basis or the current, current market value of that virtual currency. Um, and as with um, any other reporting provisions, um, it's a good idea, obviously, to always get um, receipts for the contribution itself and, um, and have the charitable organization sign off on a form 8283. All right, um, cryptocurrency loans are also used. Um, they're, they're, they're common. Um, there are two main types of cryptocurrency loans. Uh, the first type of cryptocurrency loans involves one party, the borrower borrowing virtual currency from the other party, the lender, with the uh, borrower posting collateral. The borrower agrees to return to the lender an amount identical to the same virtual currency at the end of the agreement, and the lender agrees to learn the collateral. These transactions are typically structured to resemble securities lending transactions. The borrower is free to sell and otherwise dispose of the virtual currency subject to the loan, and the lender is often allowed to sell or otherwise dispose of the collateral. If during the terms of the agreement there is an airdrop or a hard fork with respect to a particular virtual currency that has been borrowed, the borrower would transfer back to the lender units of the virtual currency identical to those that were received in the airdrop or hard fork. In the second type of transaction, a lender loans the borrower fiat currency um, and the borrower posts virtual currency with the lender as collateral. Uh, the principal objection of these type of transactions is, to, is to, for the borrower to monetize the virtual currency position without triggering a taxable sale. These transactions are relatively straightforward, and when the loan matures, the borrower repays the lender the dollar amount of the loan plus interest and taking back the identical virtual currency which the borrower has presented as posted as collateral. All right. Um, what is an NFT? Um, NFTs, um, it's fairly new. Um, over the past year or so, um, the interest in them has really spiked. You, can, you can't go anywhere without hearing about it. Um, you know, there, a few months ago, it was actually uh, featured on an episode of Saturday Night Live. Uh, but really, more interestingly about uh, NFTs is um, there's a, a case of a, a New York Times publisher. So a, a New York Times reporter went ahead and wrote an article, and that article itself was he basically minted an NFT. And the article itself says, well, why did someone pay me $560,000 for a picture of my column? Well, well they did. Um, that was the, that was the uh, winning bid uh, for his NFT. Interestingly enough, afterwards, he also said, well, now what can I do with my tax consequences? 
Um, so the concept of an, of, an, of an NFT is to marry the world of digital assets with the security of cryptocurrency. An NFT is a digital asset with a certificate of authenticity, which is protected by copyright law. When one purchases an NFT, that individual is acquiring a hack or resistant uh, proof of public ownership of a digital asset. Um, okay, so let's let's kind of talk about how an NFT is taxed. So um, so let's assume a creative NFT. Um, let's call him Bob. Bob goes ahead and creates an NFT, and Bob sells the NFT for one ether. Uh, let's assume at today's rate, the one ether is worth $1,976.59. Um, in this case, what will happen is Bob will report $1,976.59 as ordinary income associated with the sale of the NFT. This is because Bob is in the trade or business of making NFT. Since he created the NFT, he's going to wind up recognizing ordinary income on that uh, sale. Um, so that's how that works. Now, let's assume that, um, let's talk about, let's assume Linda. Linda acquires an NFT worth $3,953.18 um, or two etherin. And let's assume that she used two etherin to buy the NFT. Um, However, the two Ethereum that she wound up uh, using to purchase the NFT was, was acquired two years ago. Uh, at the time, each of those uh, digital coins were worth $400. So when Linda purchased the NFT, she would incur capital gains, or she, so when she sold it, she, she, she would wind up incurring capital gains on the sale of the, uh, the, NFT, of the, uh, the coins that she, that she sold, and that would be taxed at um, capital gains. Um, the one thing to kind of keep in mind about NFTs is that th there is, there's, a, there's, a, there's a possibility of it being taxed at a particular harsh manner. Um, a lot of people are, are promoting NFTs as art, um, which, which is great, but the problem is, is that if the Internal Revenue Service takes it a step further uh, and classifies the art as a collectible, uh, particularly in the code section uh, 408M2, um, it's taxed at a higher rate. Um, and it, it, it can be taxed as high as 28%. So if ultimately the IRS down the road goes ahead and says the NFTs are collectibles or, or, or collectible assets, um, then a lot of individuals who are acquiring these assets that go up in value could be uh, in for an unpleasant surprise down the road when they go ahead and they sell their assets. As of right now, the IRS really hasn't kind of commented about it. There's not a lot of um, uh, guidance on it, but this is something that's going to wind up probably coming up in the future. All right. Um, now, how is a how's cryptocurrency reported in a tax return? Um, it's, it's basically reported on Form 8948 of Schedule D. Um, any ordinary income um, received from cryptocurrency is going to be on Schedule 1 of the form. Any uh, virtual currency, let's just say, for example, it was received in exchange for um, kind of compensation, um, it would be reported on a W-2, so it would be, uh, be reported a little bit differently. All right. Um, let's now talk about the estate and gift tax um, consequences of transferring cryptocurrency. Um, as, of, uh, as of this year, um, individuals have a lifetime um, ability to uh, transfer assets uh, free of transfer tax uh, at 12, just over $12 million. Um, for married couples, it's $24 million, just over $24 million. So at, at these levels, you know, not a lot of people are subject to uh, estate and gift tax when it comes time for cryptocurrency. However, um, you know, it could wind up happening. I mean, someone could wind up having a, a tremendous windfall. Um, so. There are a couple techniques available to minimize the estate and gift tax. Um, you know, one could be if an individual has newly circulated coins which have a, a low value, they can one reduce their income tax consequences by uh, gifting it uh, to a designated donee. Um, that would get it out of their estate, and any kind of increase in value in that newly minted coin itself would wind up 
um, passing on to uh, somebody else. So you, that was one way to actually go ahead and, and reduce an estate's uh, estate and gift tax uh, consequences. Another way of doing it, obviously, as we, we just mentioned before, would be to actually go ahead and, and donate uh, cryptocurrency to a, a, a recognized charity. Um, that gets that estate. Uh, it's good for a gift and estate tax purposes. And on top of it, too, it, it, it could yield a nice tax deduction. Um, whereas the estate and gift tax consequences uh, or planning are, are fairly um, straightforward when it comes time for a domestic individual, where things become complicated is when you're dealing with non-residents. Um, when you're dealing with a foreign investor, um, you know, we, we, we have an awful lot of uh, non-residents uh, from other countries who have homes here in the Bay Area, who spend time here in the Bay Area. Um, they don't have green cards. They don't pass a so-called substantial presence test where they're here long enough to be classified as US people. But they merely spend some time here. Um, and when you have a non-resident here temporarily, um, the estate and gift taxes are different. They don't get the $12 million exception. exception. They get a six, six, $60,000 exemption unless there is a, a treaty uh, that comes into place that allows for a greater credit. Um, so the way you have to look at it is that the, uh, the, the estate and gift tax for US tax purposes only applies to US CITES property. Um, US CITES property can be best determined as basically the physical location of the decedent's property. Um, for non-resident aliens, that's basically tangible property, real property. Um, that's located in the US. Uh, currency, that's physically located in the US at time of, of, of a death or, um, or a gift. Um, so the problem is now, how do you go ahead and how do you determine cryptocurrency for purpose of CITES? Um, you know, that, that becomes an issue. Um, so in, in the United States, as with many other countries, there is an author lack of guidance or rules for determining the situs of cryptocurrency. Neither I IRS um, guidance released under IRS notice 2014-12 uh, or revenue rule in 2019-24 uh, or any of the frequently asked questions that accompany these uh, rulings discuss anything about categorizing a situs of an intangible asset such as a cryptocurrency. Um, so for us, advisors, that puts us into a, a really, really precarious situation. Um, you know, so let's just say you have a non-resident, and let's just say the non-resident has cryptocurrency on a US exchange, such as you know, Coinbase. Well, Coinbase um, is a US company. Um, you know, it, it's it's lo physically located here in the US, so most likely, um, if that non-resident has cryptocurrency or crypto assets on Coinbase, then it's, it's going to be U.S. CITES property. There's not going to be much of a debate there. Where things become a little bit more complicated when you're talking about lesser known um, exchanges. Um, you know, when they're lesser known exchanges, um, let's just say they have this, they're, they're foreign uh, exchange, but let's just say they have an office here in the U.S. Let's just say they have um, some of their, their, their some of their, there's, let's just say that the server that holds the account is here in the US. Um, these are the kind of situations where you know, we don't know. Um, and that, that puts us into a situation where you, know, you can wind up advising a client to pay too much uh, in the way of estate and gift taxes or too little in the way of estate and gift taxes because you, there's just there's no guidance for it. And then that's not even talking about wallets. Um, you know, Karen went into detail about wallets. She went into detail of talking about software and, and hardware wallets. Um, so the question then becomes we're talking about private keys. Well, where is those keys held? You know, is, is the key held here in the United States? Um, is it held? Do you have access to those keys, seed phrases, and so forth? held in a safe or an attorney's office here in the United States. Um, you know, in, in those kind of situations, you know, the IRS could take a, a position that that asset, the crypto asset itself is US CITES, just because of the fact that 
there is more of, of, a, of a connection or nexus uh, with the United States. Um, so what do you have to kind of look at you know, for, for purposes of, of dealing with that non-resident who has uh, cryptocurrency? You have to look at a few things. You have to look at four different factors um, to determine um, how to go ahead and, and make some kind of es educated get or a, 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 be able to kind of advise your client properly. One, where is the location of the owner? Um, you know, how often does the owner actually spend time here in the U.S.? Um, secondly, the location of the of the exchange account. Where is that that exchange account uh, located? As I mentioned before, if the exchange account is located um, here in the U.S., uh, pretty good argument there that it, that it has a U.S. site as property. Then look at where the location of the exchange's servers are. If the exchange, if the, the exchange may be a foreign exchange, but if their servers are here in the U.S., um, the IRS can make a very compelling argument that the cryptocurrency itself is a U.S. situs asset. Um, and then look at you know the location of the digital wallet. Where is that digital wallet located? Um, that itself will also kind of um, go into really whether the asset itself, the, the uh, these, these digital assets itself, whether or not they're um, going to be defined as U.S. situs or not. Um, anyway, that's, that's all I have to say. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking before all of you. So I think we have a couple minutes. Um, if anyone had any questions, um, we'd be more than happy to try to answer them now. Yes? So I'll repeat the question. So um, it, uh, the gentleman in front here is asking whether or not the U.S. exchanges allow for a living trust to be uh, the owner um, of an, a, a it, It's going to be in the terms of the agreement. Right. You have to kind of look at that terms of agreement. So if the terms state that it can, then yes, it, it could. Any other questions? I think I... Oh, yes, go ahead. So over the past six months, nine months, um, I've read incidents of hacking of crypto assets. Um, how, how does um, the attorneys and the accountants, FedEx as advisors, help their clients determine whether the particular investment that they're considering um, is secure or more exposed to hacking? Okay, so the question is, how do we, um, as how do we advise someone in terms of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, securing them against uh, hacking, which is um, you know happening all over the place? You know, that that's kind of comes into a little bit of more of a, a technical type of question. I do know I'll speak that we have, have had a lot of clients that talk about dusting. A dusting is oh, something, a, a type of kind of hacking um, method in which people go in and they put, uh, seemingly are able to kind of uh, test and put some cryptocurrency into an account, um, but that as, as in the, the user can actually use that. They use it just to test, to, to get your information out. Um, I guess, you know, it's just, it's a lot of it's kind of, um, you know, for the wary, the wild, wild west out there. I would say um, you just have to be very careful in, in what it is that they, that they um, put their, their monies into. It, it's, it's difficult because, you know, at what point is it, are you becoming like a financial advisor rather than their, yeah. you know, a state or tax attorney? Um, I, think, I think the best step there would be to hire um, a, 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 a professional who kind of, understands that area, understands um, how secure uh, an investment's going to be. I think as, a, as attorneys, I think that might be you know, beyond what we could advise about, but I, but I definitely think that a, a, an expert um, might be the, the best option there. And that is um, a good question. I mean, that's obviously a, a huge issue. Um, you know, we had a slide about, um, you know, about the theft losses too. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not something that people are experiencing, and, and it does need to be addressed. Yeah. Do, you, do you folks have resources that you can make available to the audience of what you refer to as experts in this area? 
Oh, so the question is if we had any resources um, in regards to uh, experts in this area. I mean, there's a couple. Of I mean, we could, we could, if you want, I mean, if you want to email me offline, I mean, I, I won't recommend anybody, but we can send to you, um, you know, some individuals' names maybe. Okay. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, the gentleman in front. Digital asset executors. Um, sorry. <laughs> Oh, yes, sorry. the gentleman in the front, yeah. <laughs> uh, regarding uh, digital asset executors, uh, given the volatility of crypto and that the regulatory landscape is constantly changing around it, um, are we anticipating uh, seeing a sort of different treatment of what is considered uh, a breach of fiduciary duty in terms of asset mismanagement or non good investing? Uh, is, is there more leeway? Or are we Right, so I think the question is kind of asking, uh, you know, are, are we, should we anticipate more litigation in, in terms of, you know, um, Well, there's, there's definitely going to be more litigation. Um, you know, is, is there going to be more, more regulation in this area? I mean, I'm assuming down the road there will be more regulation, but, you know, when that's going to come out and, and how that's going to be drafted, any kind of statutes can be drafted, I, I, I don't think we can comment on. Okay, uh, yes. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I think that I think there would be an assignment type situation. So the question is kind of going towards um, whether or not how is it actually being placed in the trust. And yeah, you, you can't you can't place it into a trust. I mean, it's just not going to happen during someone's lifetime. I mean, this this has come up. We've had clients ask that um, over and over again. So we don't we don't know a way of doing it. Um, but typically, what happens is when someone passes away, it, it is assigned. Um, that's how it's come across uh, what we saw in the past. So then would you recommend doing just a crypto memorandum or also maybe an assignment, a separate assignment as well? That's true. I'd probably do a separate assignment as well. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I just have kind of some fundamental questions. So is, you started out saying it's, we can, it's akin to a commodity. So, right. so when one purchases, goes on to an exchange and purchases cryptocurrency for X amount of dollars, it, is the ownership of it then issued in my name or is it, is it attached to my, my code that I get that I put in my it's wallet? Attached to code. Yes. Is that what physically happens? So yes. it's not in my name. Right, on. right. Code yes, yes, a code. Right, yes, correct. It's the code number. It's that public key that we were talking about. It's a one time my code. Right. right. So then I physically have right. to give it, or my clan will say, this person here gets my, my commodity. Right. My and then she has to just take possession of it. Right? She's not interfacing with anything on Bitcoin or doing no. any type of retitling or anything. Right. It's just basically the person who gets it who has the password yeah. gets it. Right, it's right. Like the Wild West. Yes. So when I can get my hands on yeah. it, it's mine. Right. So it's, so the question is pertaining to the mechanics of, of, of how the crypto is, is passed on. And, and you're correct. Um, that's exactly the right way to put it. Um, it. It's really by that, like I said, it's that that pass, that, yeah. that key that um, and or, or the seed phrase the, for the wallet that's holding it. That's why it's so, you know, kind of ad nauseum hitting that because it's such an important, because once you, if you own it, right, you have that key, right, then it's yours. Yeah, so it's like, it's just like having gold in the safe. If you can get to the safe and you know how to get it, then you can take the You have the key, right? <laughs> that's correct, yeah. <laughs> Yep. Right, finders keepers, yep. All right, go ahead. So, <laughs> if, uh, if an executor or a successor trustee or an agent under an individual's power of attorney is under the power section given access to uh, digital assets as some of our uh, drafting software uh, gives them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, is that sufficient to have that person be able to access an individual's wallet? Or, or does the language need to be more specific? So the question is in regards to the power of attorneys, right? The power of attorney forms and basically, you know, what kind of language needs to be in there for someone to be able to access someone's wallet. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll see if you, you know, what, if you have any thoughts on that. But, um, you know, I, I, that, that's where the, the difficulty becomes, right? Um, I think you could put it on the form, but without the, I think, the I think, phrase. I think you have, you have to break it down into two. First, you have to get the access to the cryptocurrency. Right. So once you have the access to the cryptocurrency, I think the, the forms itself can be drafted um, in a way that the crypto asset can be sold and, and so forth. Right, through, through the power of attorney form, right. but you still need to have access to it. Right. I think also your question was whether or not that, that in and of itself could give you access, but no. Well, it depends on the terms of the agreement, right? Once again, all it, it goes once again back to, if, if it's an, on an exchange, it goes back to that, the terms of the agreement. The, I mean, nobody reads the terms of agreement, right? I mean, it's just a big, long thing. No one bothers reading it. You know, they just assume that, you know, something scroll, happens scroll, to them. Scroll, scroll, scroll. So when something happens to them, they'll just pass on to their heirs. But um, so you, you got to look at the, the, that has to be studied um, if that particular exchange um, allows um, for it to be passed on and with, with the power of attorney and so forth, then fine. But if not, then you have to access it first and then go from there. Oh, yes, go ahead. Do you think that the, if the terms of Rufata conflict with the terms of service, that Rufata sort of trumps the So the question is if, 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 if the Rufata and the terms are uh, basically uh, uh, you know, uh, they're in conflict, who is it that, that would prevail? The, the only thing that Rufata does, the way I read it, um, it allows a digital executor to go ahead and access someone's account. Um, provided the terms of the agreement of the exchange, you know, allow for it. Um, even under Rafada, if you know the executor does not have the password, Rafada is not going to go ahead and trump the, the agreement. Oh yes, go ahead. Um, I'm curious as to crypto is very easy. When you do the memo and then you do the instructions afterwards, once you put the passwords down and the access codes to that, I mean, they only need that and it's very hard to trace crypto right. after that. Right. So what kind of instructions are you giving your clients so far as putting passwords or the access to the actual crypto? Right. Separate. <laughs> Basically. The question was, sorry, really quick, I'm just repeating it because um, this is also being filmed. Um, so the question was in regards to the security um, for the uh, memora memorandums. Mm -hmm. so, so the memorandum itself, basically, what it should do is should discuss um, these, these accounts and provide the instructions to obtain the accounts. When it comes time for the passwords, the passwords itself should be kept in a separate location and secure. There should be a backup as well. Uh, two separate locations um, and kept someplace secure, someplace that if there's a fire, a flood, et cetera, et cetera, it, it, it won't be damaged. So the memorandum itself is just basic instructions. It, it, think of it as kind of like, you know, someone's going to pass, or someone does, they don't know they're going to die, right? Or they don't know when they're going to die. So they, they go ahead and they write a letter in their own handwriting to their loved ones and say, look, here's the crypto assets that I have. Here's where it can be located. And that's it. That's as far as it goes. And then, you know, there's a separate password that is going to be kept, kept someplace separate and distinct. Um, the memorandum itself should designate a helper. That helper itself should know where the passwords are. That should be someone that's trusted. And Carrie, as Karen was mentioning, now practice insurance in case they go ahead and take the passwords and, you know, and steal the, the crypto. Um, but it, it, you know, it, there is no hard set fast rules for it. I mean, you know, if somebody wants to go ahead and put the passwords on the memorandum, they can. It's not recommended, but they can do that. I mean, the whole thing kind of almost um, favors people who are just, like I said, again, it, it favors people who are almost OCD about, about yeah. everything. We, we had a client who came in um, asking about uh, cryptocurrency and how to put it on his, on his forms, and we were just going 
down just line by line, literally, um, with this gentleman. So um, it, 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 in this scenario, it, it favors uh, that type of person. So a detail-oriented person. Detail yes. OK, any other questions? OK, yes? So <clears throat> it sounds like you're recommending for estate plans, which include crypto, that there be um, a digital executor in addition to successor trustee. But I'm kind of wondering if that person, the digital executor, um, would also be involved if you have a married couple. Um, if you need that person after the first half end. Oh, mm -hmm. So the question I think is regards to, I guess, in what scenarios would the digital uh, trustee really kind of, and, and would they be necessary in a, a married couple type situation? I mean, again, we kind of have to see, like, you know, that list before of like, when you're looking at the actual client themselves, right? What it, I mean, it, it, it really depends. You know, it depends on the situation. Do you need to have two digital executors or one digital executor? It, it depends. It, it all, you have to look at the client itself and, and see what's going to be best for the client. In some certain circumstances, you may have to have uh, two digital executors. It's possible. Um, you know, it just, it, it's, it's always done on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's no hard, set, fast rules in this. OK. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.